going to show the New York Times fascinating documentary on Christine Quinn uh, and have a panel discussion with the, some folks from the campaign and some production folks. Uh, and tonight's forum is going to be moderated by Rick Burke. Uh, Rick is no stranger to the forum. He's been a panelist and a moderator on several occasions. He was a 1997 IOP fellow. Uh, he's currently a member of our senior advisory committee. And his title currently at the New York Times is senior editor and director of video content. So he's the video guy for the New York Times website. So if you've seen their amazing videos, um, his job is to try to get more of those out there and produced and, and viewed. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Rick, who's going to moderate tonight's forum. Rick. <coughs> Thank you, Trey. Can you hear me? Is this on? Thank you, Trey. Um, thanks, everyone, for coming. This, I think, is going to be a great event. And what makes it really, what's going to make it great is it's not just us boring journalists, but we have two people from the campaign who we have not spoken to except for, hello, just five minutes ago, since this documentary came out. So how often do you get to see their reaction to our documentary? So, <laughs> so, um, and, um, so first, I, I just want to um, especially thank Josh I say the chief strategist for the Quinn camp campaign, and, and Mike Morey for, for their participation tonight and throughout the documentary. So um, they're really good sports to all along and to be here tonight. So thank you. Thanks. Can we have some applause for them? <laughs> and on my left from, from the New York Times video team, we have um, Nancy Donaldson, who is the supervising producer of this documentary. We have Zaina Barakat, who is a video journalist who, whose idea was to do this in the first place early in the year. And we have Brent McDonald, the lead video journalist on the project. We also have a whole crew of other people who worked night and day to make this documentary happen who, who we couldn't fit on stage. But this, I think, will give you a good representation of, of um, the people involved. And I, I just want to say, I. Our goal, and I hope the, the end result of this documentary was, um, to, my, to, to me, it has a universal appeal. You don't have to live in New York. You don't have to know who Christine Quinn is. But to me, it really shows sort of an inside, authentic look of what it's like to run for political office today, especially if you live in New York especially if you add the layer if you're, if you're a woman, especially if you're openly gay, all these extra things that, um, that Christine Quinn had to deal with. And I think the other thing that I think this, um, this documentary accomplished, or at least it was our goal, was to show the relationship uh, between a candidate and her spouse. Because you often don't see that kind of um, relationship up close, straight or gay. It's, it's a unique thing. And it's something you, couldn't, you, couldn't, you wouldn't know from reading our daily coverage or anyone's daily coverage. It was something new and different about this documentary. So those were two of our goals that we hope, hoped we accomplished. Why don't I start with Zaina? And why don't, this is something that we normally don't do at the <coughs> New York Times, half hour documentaries tied to the news where we had special access. Why did you think this was a good idea to start with? I didn't know that it, what it was going to turn out to be, but I knew that, you know, what we can do best at the times is is do these sort of longer form things that we hadn't done a 30 minute doc per se. We had done some maybe 20 minute things, but um, I just knew that uh, we could uh, kind of have a totally different look at the mayoral race by taking a step back and sort of observing it uh, unfold and showing it after the fact. Um, that was something that we, you know, there are lots of news organizations in New York, New York One, uh, NBC, CBS, there are all these things, uh, news organizations that are doing it day by day, minute by minute, and so we had an opportunity to kind of have that up-close New York look, but um, from a different viewpoint. And this all started in last March with Zaina and I and Carolyn Ryan, the political editor, and Josh and Christine Quinn and I all had lunch to discuss doing this project. Josh, why did you all decide to go along with it. You're very persuasive. <laughs> but, but, but he did put us off for several months. Well. Um, so uh, why, why did you put us off, and then why did you decide to do it? Well, we, I, I'm not sure we put you off. I think we uh, uh, had initial discussions, and 
Um, I think both sides of those kind of discussions fell off uh, for a little while. Um, we were busy in a campaign. You guys were busy running a newspaper and doing great videos. So I think time uh, got in the way. Uh, Anthony Weiner got in the race. I think that changed the um, uh, focus uh, for you guys, I think, and for us. So we became less center stage. Um, and I think the discussion started again, or you guys contacted us again in earnest right about the time Anthony had the, uh, everyone's familiar with the, what happened in that race, perhaps, or I could talk about it, at least give you the G-rated version. Um, uh, Anthony Weiner got in the race, uh, kind of surged into a tie for first or first, and then um, it came out that some other, uh, he had been doing some other chatting uh, under the alias of Carlos Danger, um, cannot make this stuff up. Uh, and then uh, he went from kind of mid-20s in the polls all the way down and uh, bottom fell out. And then I think the conversation started again with, uh, with you guys. Mike, what was your biggest fear about doing this project? Yeah, so um, I actually, uh, it took a lot of convincing for me. Um, uh, my biggest fear was, uh, on the one hand, there was a lot of management that had to happen internally while we're running a campaign uh, in a tough race with multiple opponents. So it required a great deal of focus to ensure that you could get the access you wanted. Um, and, and frankly, it was uh, an unvarnished inside look. Uh, and mistakes happen in campaigns. And so those mistakes could very well have become part of uh, the documentary. Um, Sometimes mistakes show the humanity of an individual. Sometimes mistakes show flubs. We say things sometimes that um, we regret we said. And so there was always that, my, in, in my mind, there was a fear that uh, you might get a look at something that if you were there in the moment might understand it. But if you're not there in the moment and someone else were to look at it five months later, uh, could be problematic uh, in the long term. So it, it took a little convincing. Um, Nancy, what was your biggest fear on your, your end going into this project? I think my biggest fear was access and just are we going to be able to, if we're going to devote this amount of resources. So the New York Times usually doesn't put six people on a project. It's usually one or two. Um, and so to do something of this scale required a very large commitment of resources from some of our best video journalists in the building. And I think my biggest fear was that we're going to spend so much time doing this and all we're going to get is the stuff that everyone else is getting. And the only, really the only reason to do it is to show something that people haven't seen. And, yeah. and I would, look, I, I want to be honest, my biggest fear, because by the time we agreed to this, it was clear that it was a um, very tough fight. We could win, we could lose, but it was a very tough fight. My biggest fear, and we talked about this, was that we would lose <coughs> and that uh, Chris, who is uh, a dear friend of mine and a wonderful person was going to look kind of bad in the loss and that it would be something that would stick with her over time, which would not have been fair uh, to her, would not have been the right thing uh, to do. Um, she did lose, but I think the documentary, uh, to everyone's credit, is something that shows kind of her humanity uh, and is actually, I think, a, a, a accurate and, and moving portrait of what it does mean to run in New York City and, and how unbelievably tough uh, this is um, in a way that most, no story in print can capture and I don't think a lot of you know, movies have captured or, or documentaries have captured. Brent, how did you prepare to live and breathe Christine Quinn for several weeks, day after day, night after night? Um, I told my wife I probably won't be home much <laughs> first. But uh, also, I guess when thinking about, I mean, what sold me on the project and what got me excited about it and willing to invest so much time, sort of day after day, week after week, um, covering the campaign was, was the access. And while at the same time knowing that you know, access can be overrated, but the opportunity to sort of get close to a candidate, to s slip into their skin, feel what it's like to be them on the campaign trail, but knowing that just being you know, closer to a candidate physically doesn't necessarily um, bring you closer to the truth of what they're experiencing. So that was a challenge to me about, okay, what are, will we really be able to capture um, with the access that we've been given? And, um, so. and, and let me just say to everyone, 
um, as much as we tried to convince them to do this, there was some um, concern on our end about whether we should do this at the New York Times because um, it's something we had an agreement with the campaign to get special access that our political reporters day to day weren't getting. So we were privy to certain information, so we kind of walled off what we were doing with what they were doing. And there was a concern, like you might think that it would have been terrific video if we had seen a meltdown by Christine Quinn on video. But what if we had seen that and it was really disturbing and she won the primary and we withheld that from our audience and then she won the, the general election, we could be accused of, you know, why did you um, withhold that? P voters should have known that. So we were up against that happening. We were up against why did you decide to put all these resources on her when, and the New York Times later endorsed her? Was it all part of a cabal, even though the endorsement is a whole separate, you know, non-editorial thing? There are a lot of internal concerns that we had to overcome as well. And in the end, you kind of just kind of cross your fingers and hope it's going to all work out. And there has to be a trust level. I mean, the press and politicians are sort of natural adversaries, but there has to be a, a certain trust and respect for us to do this. They have to trust us that we are not going to take what we have and twist it in a way that's unfair. And we have to trust them enough to know that they will let us into enough events so it's not a staged, not a whole staged thing. So there was this, this sort of tug going on, but I think we both, I, I have to say, I think on both ends we lived up to, to the deal. Why don't you set up the first clip that we'd like to show, and that's, that's about term limits. Right, so um, Christine Quinn, as many of you know, was uh, been the speaker, count, uh, speaker of the New York City Council, and I think a lot of what we observed was that she was running on her record as speaker. But uh, following her on the trail, we began to you know, re observe that um, people also had a real issue with a number of the decisions she made as speaker, and one of those was the decision uh, playing a, sort of a key role in extending term limits and allowing Michael Bloomberg to, to run for a third term as well as the other city council members. Um, so the clip that you're about to see is um, on the trail with her as she's out um, leafleting and having an interaction with someone uh, spontaneously and then me uh, circling back with her in the car afterwards about how that went down. Thank you very much. Thank you. I can never vote for you after what you did on term limits. Okay. Well, I'm sorry about that. It was unforgivable. Okay. okay. Thank you for stopping. Mike Bloomberg is an asset in a general election, but a liability in a Democratic primary. I think somewhere along the way she had to define herself. Was she a challenger or a continuation of Bloomberg? Why do you think people are so polarized over the term limits issue? Why, why it's important to them now? Uh, I'm not a hundred percent sure because um, you know that it's still something so many people are so passionate about. I'm not. I don't really know. I mean, I understand certainly why people are angry about it. The depth of the anger still sometimes surprises me, but I certainly understand that. I don't minimize what we did by any stretch of the imagination. Josh and Mike, what did you think of that segment? How, what's your reaction to it? Um, <clears throat> I mean, it was something that clearly we heard about uh, on the campaign trail. Uh, it does not surprise me. Uh, that you saw that interaction. It was obviously something that as a campaign we were prepared for as a negative against her. Um, and it was one that uh, in a lot of ways preordained our relationship with the incumbent uh, in terms of our positioning with him 
uh, not only the fact that she had um, been his legislative partner for eight years, he was mayor, she was speaker, and they did a lot of things together. Um, a lot of the kind of uh, discussion during the campaign was, and even in the year before, should she distance herself from him? Should she get close to him? What's the dynamic there? And the vote to allow voters a, a chance to vote for him for a third term and, and this council in some ways preordained that relationship because it meant that you couldn't really run away from him because in fact you had given voters the opportunity to give him another term. Mike? Yeah, well, we knew um, for a lot of people uh, in this race that that decision and that decision alone would uh, have the final impact on, on the way they would cast their ballot. Um, at the same time, uh, we had part of what was unique about Christine Quinn, um, what is unique about Christine Quinn is that um, she is not someone who runs away from a decision that she makes. Um, she is someone who, uh, on, on every decision, in fact, most decisions, she's sort of steadfast and she will accept the consequences for a decision. We knew there would be consequences for that decision. Um, and what we uh, tried to do and what she did on the campaign trail was say, I, I understand uh, that this is a, a problem for you. I would urge you to look at, in the course of my career, uh, a host of issues that I've worked on, and I'd ask you to look at my record in its totality. Um, but we, we were not, it, it's just not part of who Christine Quinn is. Um, to, it's a decision she stood by, it's a decision she was willing to say to the voters, look, it was a tough decision, I made it. I accept the consequences for that. And frankly, we oftentimes message that in juxtaposition to some of our opponents in the race who were less likely to be as steadfast in position. Um, so um, we knew it was going to be uh, 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 something that came up a lot, and it did. Brent, how did, what did it take for you to get that scene? Well, that was one of probably a few different scenes where that issue came up. People came, walked up to her um, to address her on the term limits. And I mean, in that particular, and sometimes I was up close sort of observing within a few feet. And this time I always had a long lens and I was sort of at a distance um, zooming in, you know, just following her face fairly uh, closely cropped in, as you can tell. But, um, I mean, just logistically it didn't take all that much, just sort of being there and observing and staying out of the way. Uh, and, you know, I, I can't tell necessarily that she responded differently in that scenario than she would have were I not there. I, don't, I didn't ever feel like that affected at all how she responded to those sort of mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. Nancy, can you talk about anybody but Quinn and why we thought that was important to get it in this document, to get them in this documentary? And then we'll show the clip. Yeah, uh, anybody but Quinn was obviously an important sort of force against her. And they had captured a lot of different scenes of um, people campaigning against like anyone but Christine Quinn. And so it was a pretty powerful force. And you know, I think it was something that we felt was important to include. It's obviously kind of hard to explain who these people are and sort of the magnitude of their force. But um, we tried to do it in this scene that we're going to show. Can you Pardon? Yes, of course. Did you know Quinn has blocked every animal protection bill in the city council? Has she? You know, she blocked a bill that would mandate sprinklers in pet stores. Hundreds of dogs and cats have burned to death in pet store fires. Well, that sounds awful. The animal rights movement has focused on the horse carriage industry. And there's nothing in New York like a small, well-organized group to make themselves heard. Good morning, anybody but Quinn? Yeah. For the record. <laughs> <laughs> Hundreds of dogs and cats have not, not died. burned death <laughs> in fires in New York City pets, just to be clear. <laughs> now, can you two tell us um, how nervous, when this, when this came out, you lose the election, this comes out, like, was it hard to watch this or to decide to watch it? The video. The this, video, this actual. Well, I did. Did you have someone, watch, like your wife, watch it no, first? No, my wife has not, my wife has not watched it. I, 
I sat down, I took all the shoelaces off of my shoes, <laughs> took my belt off, put it in the other room, and then, <laughs> and then watched it. I mean, yeah, it was uh, um, one of my, yes, it was, there was two weeks between the end of the election and, or so, and the movie came out. Um, and I would call Mike every day and say, have you heard from Rick? What's the movie? When is it coming out? How bad is it going to be? Um, yeah, it was very nerve-wracking uh, because, you know, we didn't want Chris, as we said before, we didn't want Chris to look bad. We didn't want to, you know, you guys could take the interviews you did with us and make us look like total jerks. Um, and so we were concerned about uh, kind of what the post, this was going to in some ways define the post, could have defined the post-mortem. Uh, and, you know, as I said before, instead, to your credit, what I think it did was give an insight into what it means to run in a, high, in a, in a, place, in a place like New York. If I can address the anybody but Quinn uh, campaign for one moment, is it okay if I talk about what that was about sure. and why that was? So um, there was a bill before the city council to ban horse carriages. So you know, like when you go into Central Park and you do the carriage with the horse. Um, there was a bill to ban the horse carriages, which Chris refused to pass because it was 300 jobs for the the people who do the, you know, the, the people drivers. who run, the drivers. Um, and these horses, I guess at one point, a long time ago, were not treated well. I mean, I don't really know. But right now, it's like the most regulated industry in New York City. The horses get more vacation than the French. Five weeks. Like, literally. <laughs> more vacation time. It's unbelievable. They're treated fine. Uh, and she highly regulated. But there is a group of animal rights activists who, um, really hated this. It made them extraordinarily angry. And then they launched this Anybody But Quinn uh, campaign funded by, I mean, this is such, this is actually great kind of political, funded by a gentleman who was a, is, started something called Manhattan Storage, right? Manhattan, mm -hmm. Manhattan Storage, which they, like, you know, one of these storage places. Um, he owns garages. And he, so he's a garage owner and he owns Manhattan, Manhattan Storage. He wanted the places that the horses are kept, the stables in the city, he wanted those sold so that he could buy them for his garages and make money as kind of in increasing his garage. So he decided to spend a million dollars beating Chris so that she wouldn't be mayor. So that, and the, the current mayor, excuse me, I'm sorry, look, the Democratic <laughs> nominee for mayor, <laughs> who will be mayor, um, has said, though the Blasio said that um, during the course of the committee, he promised on day one, on day one, he would outlaw these horse-drawn carriages during the camp. On day one, he would, which when you think about what you're going to do on day one, find the bathroom, you know, that might not be on the table. Yeah. Mike, on, on a different note, you were just, what was it like for you to see this for the first time? Uh, it was hard. Um, it was it was it was very difficult to see it, um, and it was difficult for a good reason. Um, I think that uh, I'm both. I was a student of politics before I was a practitioner of politics. Um, so I was I was a political science professor uh, for a couple of years, and one of the things that and we I primarily taught campaigns and elections and institutions. And one of the things that sort of we look at politics and we see these politicians, and we see sort of this um, uh, sport occurring. You've got you know, team A and team B, and they have debates, and they go at each other. They're up in the polls. They're down in the polls. Their allies come in. People spend money. There's ads all over. And we often forget that these people put their pants on the same way you and I do every morning. Uh, that these people have relationships. These people have emotions. These people uh, can be sensitive. These people can be tough. Um, and uh, unless you are with these individuals and you see that yourself, you would never know it primarily because of the way in which we cover politics. And so what was somewhat heartbreaking to watch while at the same time so encouraging to see documented was the humanity of the individuals who were involved in this process. And that you know it's very easy for us to go online and write some anonymous blog post and say some very inappropriate things. It's very easy for us to make a campaign contribution to an independent expenditure group for hundreds of dollars and then launch attacks on an individual. And we just assume that there's sort of this sort of um, other 
that don't feel emotion the same way that you and I do or don't have the same kind of relationships that you and I do. And the, the documentary did a phenomenal job of actually demonstrating to folks who don't see what happens behind closed doors that these are people um, and that you know it's a tough business and you need to be tough to be in it, but I don't care how tough you are, uh, you can't take those kinds of lobs, uh, man, woman, or child, and not have um, let it affect you after a while. And if it does anything, my hope is that um, we recognize and appreciate that while we give public officials and politicians sort of uh, uh, we paint them with this sort of brush of self-serving interest and sort of, you know, in it for themselves. That the, what this actually might show is that these people are human beings who do feel it the same way you and I do. And I think it did a, a phenomenal job. Now, you were in, in the documentary several times mm -hmm. in, in interviews. What was the reaction to your friends and family to how you came off? Um, how you that I look came. really tired. <laughs> um, I, was, I didn't want to say, but you look great right now. <laughs> <laughs> I was tired. Um, I was very tired. Um, the, uh, there was actually, so, you know, your friends and family watch it with a very different lens because they're looking at the person they haven't seen in months. Um, <laughs> and they're seeing, you know, so they, they sort of know what I do but don't really appreciate it so much. They sort of have this West Wing idea of what we do. Um, and what uh, the response I got primarily was um, that it was really honest. You were honest about both your opponents. When your opponent deserved credit, you, you gave credit. Um, you were honest about some of the difficulties uh, in running a race with, with a female candidate, with a gay candidate. Um, and so it was sort of the appreciation for, and frankly because of the arrangement we had in doing it, knowing that it wouldn't be out until after the election were over, it sort of does free you up to a degree to be honest. Um, and so that's primarily what I heard. Let, let's show a clip now where we have, we talk about political ads and, I, and both Mike and Josh I think are in this clip. In the course of the last five, six weeks, I've had to beat back stories about the shoes Chris Quinn wears, how much she pays to have her hair done, why she wore pink to a debate, um, why, she la why her laugh is so loud. Um, I don't see those stories, and, and I certainly know that those things don't get asked of, of some of our opponents in this race. As mayor, I'll build on our progress and I'll make sure that nobody gets left behind. But too happy? Yeah. yeah. Chris's gender as the only woman in the race, it's been a challenge. It has been a challenge. And I'll make sure that nobody gets left behind. One more, guys. Back to one. Keep your eyes, try to keep the eyes open. I don't want the observation. You know, we have to recognize that and calibrate that to a certain degree or be mindful of it. It's much harder to lead with tough uh, when you're a woman candidate than it is if you're a male candidate. Everybody, we're going to stop, all right? Everybody come down the slide. Everybody come down to the bottom over here. And when, I, and when we're ready, we're going to do what I told you, all right? We're going to start over there. Are we almost ready? Zeta, could you talk about those, your, how we dealt with her being a woman in this documentary and the sensitivities involved? It was something that people talked about a lot in terms of um, you know, the coverage and all these things, but I, I actually went through and I was trying to find exact examples of this. Like, people are you know, saying these things about her because she's a woman or because she's gay, and it's so much more subtle than that. And it's so interesting, it's like an undercurrent, and it's like really hard to find exact examples, but it's, but it's there. Um, and one thing that I wanted to make sure as we were working on this and, and watching different cuts was that these issues were kind of separated that we kind of showed her as a, you know, as a woman, as a candidate, as a gay woman, as a woman in a relationship, that, you know, her being in a relationship with a woman doesn't, wasn't defined by her sexuality, it was defined by her having a relationship with her spouse. And so it was kind of humanizing her in these ways and not just making it that she's a gay candidate, therefore her relationship in, with her spouse is somehow different. Um, so I thought that was that was shown in this. That, it was a very interesting aspect of the documentary. I just thought 
it just it humanized her in a way and you got to see her in a way. And that was something that you know we had talked about early on, how much Kim, her uh, spouse, would be in the documentary and, she, and how much she would be in the campaign. I think you guys can talk about that, but she turned out to be such an interesting voice. Um, she could speak about uh, you know, uh, Speaker Quinn in such a way that was so uh, interesting and natural because she would, didn't have the political talk political speak, so she was a huge asset for us for understanding her better. And that's something that we had no expectation <coughs> of going in, because at that original lunch in March, both Christine Quinn and um, Josh said, you're probably <laughs> not going to get her to talk at all. She's really shy. You'll be lucky if you get one interview with her. So, And she ended up being a big theme of this whole thing. N Nancy, can you talk a little? There were times in, when this was finally being edited toward the end when I know we were all saying, it's, this is either too nice or too tough. I mean, and we were trying to get it just right. Talk about that. I think, um, you know, the bar is set pretty high for creating political documentaries, and I think that plays into both the accuracy of how you present the, the person, but also sort of the style in which we edit. So there was a lot of talk about, are we, Explain, are we spending too much time on this issue and not enough on that? Are we you know, going about this the right way? And I think at the end of the day, it was trying to find a way to tell this story in a more experiential format, where you could just sort of be along the ride rather than having um, you know, heavy narration and analysis on the piece. And so I think what it took to do that was finding these moments that balanced each other and showing it to a lot of the you know, colleagues of ours who weren't intimately involved in the process to say, you know, how does this how does this come off? Because once you get so invested with content like this, it does become hard over time to be objective and to really separate yourself from what's in there and what's not in there and what you know and what you have put in um, and all of that stuff. So I think it was like a constant calibration of, are we going too far this way? Then we pull it back. And if we pull it back too far, then we try to meet in the middle. And I really do think it was up until the last draft that we really hit the mark. Let's show another clip of, to me, this is one of the most memorable searing scenes. And then we'll have Brent talk about it after it's, it's over. This is number four. And this is primary day coming out of her apartment in Chelsea. Hi, how are you? Thank you very much. Thank you. Right or left, right? Have a nice day. Watch out for Where were they going? I don't know. It's hard to tell sometimes. Brent. <laughs> so one of the things about covering Christine Quinn's campaign is that, um, as opposed to some of the other candidates, uh, her schedule didn't come out until the morning of, or the, the, the events were embargoed until the time of the event. I got the, the schedule typically the night before, um, sometimes not until, until midnight or so, but it was always, you have to be very fleet of foot. Um, but one of the reasons, and they can explain better than I can, um, that the, the, um, her itinerary was embargoed was because people like these would show up to a lot of the events, what she would call the aunties. And, um, and so this was sort of the first time I'd been able to observe. I arrived at her um, apartment on primary morning, like 6 o'clock, and we walked out. I didn't know they were going to be there, but uh, they'd gotten a heads up. And I was told, you know, we're going to take off without you, more or less. That was the, the message I was given, so don't delay. But just walking out and following her and then seeing that um, and capturing her, her reaction, you get a sense like she has dealt with this a lot. So, Do you all have it? What was your reaction to that scene? Uh, it's probably one of the hardest scenes to watch for the, the reasons I mentioned before. Um, the, the frustrating thing, you know, so. 
we, we did keep the schedule embargoed, um, and we kept it embargoed until the point in time of the actual event. Um, there had been a few instances in the course of the campaign in which, when that embargo was broken, um, not only did protesters show up, but at one point um, it became physical. Uh, uh, a state senator had been slapped, um, a, an intern had been slapped, um, and so there is, this isn't just, in some cases, some of the protest is sort of more sort of agitation than protest. And so we were very careful of that um, for that reason. Um, and uh, they can be quite disruptive, as you've seen. Can you imagine on the day of your election, um, the day you've been working for for uh, a year, um, so sort of that's the moment you sort of need to sort of get in that zone and sort of be in that place in your headspace where like, today's the last day, we've got to turn out our votes. Uh, I need to feel good, I want to be in a positive place, and you step out of your door, uh, and, and that happens. Um, so it, it, was, it was quite frustrating, uh, and it certainly had an impact, and it did require some strategic decision making uh, uh, with respect to our schedule. Sometimes they were successful, and whether that was relationships they had from people who got our schedule, and maybe they were able to get it every now and then, um, though they were able to get a hold of the schedule, and, and there's an example of of what you see, but the, I, it, it strikes me, it bothers me a little bit this episode in particular because it was sort of that, the day of the election. Um, and it sort of was indicative of. It bothers you that people did that or it bothers you that? that it bothers just, me for her to have to have experienced that I when see. she walked out of her apartment. But are you glad that it's documented? I am, no, I'm very glad it's documented. I'm very glad because I think, again, it goes to what I think overall this documentary has done which is demonstrate uh, that you know whether we like these people or not, whether we like their policies or not, whether they're on you know they're a D or an R or everything in between, they're all people. Um, and so I think that this shows you some of the, uh, particularly in moments like this, in moments where you sort of would just like to be able to sort of step out your front door on the most important day of the last year and just get to work. Quick question for Nancy. Would this have been a better or worse documentary if she had won? Better. <laughs> <laughs> Much better. I think it's a really good question. I mean, obviously, when we um, started this, she was the clear front runner. So we didn't really have a contingency plan for this to go the way that it did until um, you know a couple weeks before the primary, where the polls started to slip and. I think this was one of those situations where we knew there was a lot of potential in this story, but it really was a searcher. Like we, Brent was with them night and day. Uh, we had a couple other shooters sort of rounding out the rest of the coverage. And we were really looking for like, what story are we trying to tell? We didn't know that until um, close to the primary. And so, you know, it's hard to say because I think we were on a path of discovery and had she made it through the runoff and, uh, and onwards, it probably, I mean, it obviously would be a very different story. Um, so it's hard to say. Please line up if you have any questions. And while you're lining up, um, I'm going to ask um, an audience participation question. And that is, um, and I'll tell you in advance what my question is going to be. For those of you who have seen the whole thing, um, I'm going to ask you to pretend that the two campaign strategists aren't in the room and say, do you like Christine Quinn more because of this documentary or less. Um, so if you like her more and you feel more that she's more appealing because of this documentary, raise your hand. OK. And if you like her, if you've seen her flaws and her up close and like her less, raise your hand. One, one anyone else? That's interesting. OK, please. Um, Identify yourselves when you ask a question. Uh, just let's one one tight, brief question per person, um, and do not end your question or questions end with a question mark. Right? <laughs> That's what I'm supposed to say. All right. <clears throat> Hi. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Amna, a sophomore at the college, and I'm a member of the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum Committee. Um, after watching the documentary, is there anything that you noticed that you wish you could have changed about the campaign, specifically? regarding the sort of stop and frisk issue that DeBrosia brought up? Um, <clears throat> no, because I don't think the, I don't think the, I mean, look, obviously when you, when you lose, 
uh, you look back and you say there are things you wish you could have done differently and would have done differently. Um, in the documentary itself, I don't think that was kind of the point of the documentary. In other words, it was not like a tactical look at the campaign. So I don't look back and say there were things we wish we could have done differently. On stop and frisk, um, you know, she believes that we should have mended the uh, tactic, changed the tactic, reformed the tactic, and she took measures to do that as speaker. Yes. Hi, my name is Alec Barrett. I'm from New York and currently a master's student at the School of Education. Um, for those of you at the Times, I'm wondering, the fact that she lost, how will that shape your likelihood of taking on a project like this in the future? And for those of you on the campaign, the fact that she lost, how will this affect her public future, uh, whatever that may be? Um, who wants to grab? Sure, I'll take that. Um, I don't think it would change um, the likelihood of whether I would take on a project like this at all, actually. I think, I mean, we understood pretty well, even though she was leading at the polls, that there was a good chance that she, we thought if, even if she, she didn't win, she would still be in the runoff. We didn't expect it, ever expect it to be, the loss to be that dramatic. But, um, I mean, this is a contest. There are winners and losers, and, and so there's always gonna be a clear ending uh, to, to the story when you, when you follow a campaign. And, you know, the, the trick is just, you know, figuring out what is, what is the, the meat of the story between the beginning and the ending. Mike, does this help or hurt her chances of, of a resurrection? Well, look, Christine Quinn is, is fairly young. Um, she's not 50 years old yet, which, I mean, most members of Congress don't get elected until they're in their 60s, uh, and some of them serve until their 90s. Um, so does, did this do damage to her if she should choose at some point to serve in public office again? I don't think so. Um, I think that, um, I think it showed a side of her uh, that um, was often not portrayed, not for lack of, of authenticity, but so much so because it's sort of, folks pay attention to a horse race and not necessarily uh, an individual for the individual they are. Um, In purely political terms, is it a net plus for her? Um, as a political strategist. It, it, it's not a negative. I, I, don't, I don't know if I could say it's a net So in plus. reporter's terms, that's a plus. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, it's fun. you could have neutral. It's funny, when, I, when we, we screened this for our chief political reporter, and we were all saying, oh, poor Christine Quinn, it's gonna show her, you know, really up close and personal, losing a campaign. His first reaction is, this is the best thing to happen to her. You know, because it shows a simple, just as the audience showed, I'm not, I'm not weighing in one way or the other, but as you all said, you all <coughs> like her better, those of you who have seen it. So we'll see what, we'll see, check back in 10 years, we'll see what happens. Yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Carolina, and I'm a freshman at the college. Um, my question is more directly towards the strategy and campaign part. Do you think the outcome of the election would have been different if you would have capitalized on the identity side of politics and the fact that, and on the historic side, the fact that she was um, the first female and openly gay, um, she, she would have been the first female and openly gay mayor of New York City. Um, I mean, look, we talked about that obviously a lot in the campaign, and we talked, I mean, sorry, internally about how to talk about being the first woman, first gay, uh, potentially first gay mayor. Um, you know, people don't vote for a candidate because they are a woman, or let me put it this way, most people do not vote for a candidate because they're a woman or because they are gay. It can certainly be a factor in it, but it is not the determinative factor. And we did, we obviously, we did, you know, in any time you do a campaign, you do focus groups and you do polling and you um, talk to other people who have been in similar situations. Uh, and that was not a path to victory, was to make this about a first. Um, it can be part of the calculus, but it's not going to be the overwhelming reason to vote for someone. And I think if you talk to folks at Emily's List or anyone on the Clinton campaign from, you know, when she ran for president, they'll tell you that it can be an element of it, but it, it can't be the, the reason for it. I, I would just add to that, too, that um, since the election, <laughs> it's amazing sometimes to read 
on the one hand, you get criticized for you can't build an entire candidacy around identity. So like that's where you made your mistake. On the other hand, you didn't play up your identity enough. So uh, I mean, if you read, for, I mean, I've read enough about the, the lack of trying to use identity and, the, and I've read enough saying that uh, she ran a campaign on the fact that she would be the first woman. And so, uh, as Josh said, the data don't bear out um, that that is a winning strategy. But we've heard it from both sides that we either did it too much or we didn't do it enough. Um, our objective was always to make the case that in terms of the field that was put in front of the voters, that this woman, who is also gay, is the best candidate for the job because of X, Y, and Z. And the interesting, one of the interesting kind of things I think to look at after this campaign, after the Hillary campaign, uh, and after other similar campaigns is how does a woman run for executive, high profile executive office? Um, you add the uh, being a gay woman in there as well uh, is another layer to it, but kind of looking at that and as Zena said, ha it's not so much that the coverage is different, although there is difference in the coverage, it's how do people interpret the coverage um, is kind of a fascinating, uh, uh, sociological uh, uh, study, and one that you know I, I think we need to do if we really want to have women in high power executive positions. Is something that folks really have to take a look at. Yes. Hi, my name is Meg. Uh, I'm a sophomore here at the college. Um, so we're living a time with historic representation of women in government. Um, yeah, I was reading a, a study published this year, I believe out of American University, that showed there's a huge gender gap um, in ter amongst college age students in terms of political ambition. Um, men were twice as likely to be considering uh, a run for elected office, and over 60% of women said that they would never, under any circumstances, consider a run for office. And so having followed Christine Quinn uh, in her campaign, I was wondering if you guys have an insight into why women would be specifically um, dis disenfranchised or disenchanted with the political process or politics or... Uh, Professor Moray. <laughs> so there's the two things. One, there's the, the notion of the pipeline for women in, in politics. There simply aren't enough who are in positions for young women to see. And also the pipeline of which some people argue that it's a numbers game. The fact is in the contested elections in this country, there just aren't enough women in the races to be competitive. And so therefore, naturally, you have less women who achieve elected office. Um, I would say to you that in, in terms of um, the, the, the impact, it, uh, sort of watching these types of races and the impact it, it has on, on women, Look, you know, one of the things I'll be a, a little frank about this. I, the, it is not the, I don't necessarily think that the media is making a conscientious effort to report on women candidates in a different way. But when women politicians exhibit the same attributes as male politicians, there is a different reception of that in the public. Um, I would say to you that uh, when I think of sort of tough, effective, compromising, gets things done, I hear things like LBJ and they write volumes about the master of the Senate. Um, when I hear about really folks who work together with a Republican president of the United States to get massive reforms to Social Security and public education, I hear names like Tip O'Neill. Um, yet, it is a very different dynamic um, on the receiving end. Again, it's not necessarily the reporting end, um, but on the receiving end, there is a different sort of sociological thing going on in which the reception of a, a woman being as transactional, effective, tough, compromising is received a little different, I think. Um, and so, uh, you know, how does that play out to young women? If you know, if you see a, a, a woman be doing the same sort of exercising the same attributes as a male politician, um, and somehow the reception of that is different uh, by nature, one would say, <laughs> well, wait a minute. Um, so I think it, it certainly plays out. I also think that look, I think the reason women may not Young women may say, I don't want to enter into public office. I mean, I think there have been a lot of studies and, you know, about even women in a classroom. You probably see this in, in your classes when men are raising their hands and trying to answer every question and women are, are uh, sitting back and, and not doing that. I mean, I think there's a, a whole bunch of reasons uh, societally that women are not doing that. In fact, I had this kind of uh, this moment, I have a five-year-old daughter and at one point in the middle of the campaign, she, we're in the car and she said, can, can, can a woman even be mayor? 
And it was kind mm. of this awful moment of, wow. yeah, of course a woman can be mayor. We're trying to get one to be mayor. But it was not even, uh, you know, it's not even in her consciousness. And I hope, hopefully that will change. Let's go quickly get through the remaining five questions. Yep. Sure. Hi, my name is Will. Uh, I'm a student at the college. And uh, one of the best moments, I thought, in the documentary is that um, scene sort of at the end on, after she sort of found out she's lost and she's in that very, um, she's in an embrace with her wife and Josh trying to block the camera. And um, so I was wondering, because I've been around a lot of campaign people and there's sort of a pathological distrust of the media and how you and the Times people sort of built that relationship to the point where they could be in that room during that moment and um, throughout. Will, before you answer that, Will, thank you for setting up our final clip. Uh, it's <laughs> perfect. I didn't even tell you to do that. Can we show that? And it was all pointing in the direction of Christine Quinn as the nominee. Mm -hmm. And then things just started to go wrong. Some of them, you know, you maybe could have predicted, but much of it you could not have predicted. This is a loss and it's disappointing. Less for me personally, but for what this could have meant for a lot of people and a lot of people who worked very, very hard. And so certainly one of the things I'm going to do in the days and weeks ahead is spend time thanking people who worked really, really hard, you know, and believed in something. And I want them to know how grateful I am. And who will you be thinking of when you speak tonight? I'm just not going to answer that question. Okay. All right. Thanks. Brent, can you give us a few minutes? Sorry. Yeah. Thanks. OK, uh, Brent, what were you trying to do there, and how did you get that access? And then, Josh, what were you trying to do to stop Brent? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think uh, in the, the terms of our agreement for access at the beginning was um, uh, an hour in a hotel room the night of the, of the election as the results were coming in and, um, and in an interview. But uh, the results were coming in very fast there at the end. And um, the, what I was trying to do during this clip is actually put the, my microphone in my pocket while also just keeping the camera going and um, while also not just being in her face or too intrusive while still capturing the scene. And um, what was the rest of the question? Um, why don't we go to Josh? The rest of it was Josh trying to oh. get you out of the room. Well, uh, not a fun moment in the campaign, uh, sitting in that room. We've, uh, you know, uh, when you do this long enough, you are in that room when it's really happy, and you're in that room sometimes when it's really unhappy. Um, that was obviously the latter. Uh, you know, we had an agreement with the Times that you would have access on that night. And Chris felt, and I think the campaign felt, that when you make a, an agreement, you live by that agreement, and that uh, we tried to do that. And obviously, that was a moment when um, Chris was asked who she would be thinking about. And I think the answer probably was her mother, who had died when she was 16 years old. And I think that's certainly what was on her mind. Um, so she broke down there, and she went to hug Kim. And you know, I thought they had gotten the moment and deserved a little bit of privacy right there, and stepped in front of their camera. And you know, credit to you for honoring that agreement and letting us in the room because you know I know that wasn't easy, and that was it was a tough atmosphere in that room. So. Winning is better than losing. For yeah. just for the record, if you want to. <laughs> yes. Hi, my name is Sylvia. I'm a junior at the college. Thank you for being here tonight. Um, my question is, we focused a lot during the forum on the humanity aspect of campaigns. And given the current discourse in DC, I wanted to know your perspective of whether or not you think that uh, local politics are a little bit more vicious than federal um, politics. Because I know there's a lot of talk in the media about how much both sides hate each other. But it seems that in local politics, it's a lot more personal 
than it is on the federal level. So I don't know if you could speak to that. Thank you. Um, go ahead. Go ahead. You know, I think the, I've done a lot of federal races as well. Um, f yes, I think in a lot of ways, local races are more personal than federal races. A um, couple things. One, uh, especially, there are a couple of offices that in my experience are unbelievably, oh, I want to take a step back. The one federal office where that's not true is president. Those are very personal races. Um, in part because mayor of New York City and president of the United States are the two offices, and I've worked on a lot of mayor's races and governor's races. These are the two offices that it's the most personal that there is, in part because people in New York, I mean, there's so much press attention. There's so much glare. Um, uh, it becomes a national, it's nationalized, but it's so covered in the local races, just like a presidential races, and it just becomes personalized. Senate races, congressional races, they're about issues that in some ways are disconnected from people's lives. You know, a fight over this federal policy or that federal policy, or that it's, it just doesn't necessarily, it doesn't really get as personal. Now, having said that, I've worked on a lot of races where it comes down to very personal insults and back and forth. Someone makes a mistake and you exploit that mistake and in federal races as well. But there's nothing quite as personal as a mayor's race in New York City except, I think, a presidential race, which is deeply personal, obviously. Yes, sir. Hi, thank you. My name is Gabe Hakeem. I'm a uh, Master's of Public Administration student here at the Kennedy School. Um, I really enjoyed the documentary, and I think uh, one of the things I found interesting from you two is that you said the part that you enjoyed the most was seeing your candidate being portrayed humanely, and the hardest parts to watch were when people were treating her in an inhumane way. And I felt similarly in watching the documentary myself. On the flip side, it seems like strategy around uh, campaigns these days has almost become entirely centered around creating uh, the opposite candidate as being some inhumane object. And I wonder how much um, you as strategists and the politicians themselves view themselves as being responsible for the messages that they either explicitly or implicitly approve that are not attacks on other people's policies but are more attempts to dehumanize. Um, so I think uh, to some degree the, uh, I was, if I ever go back and, and finish my dissertation, I'm gonna change topics and talk about the celebritization of politics. And so I think that in some degrees based on um, our media culture of sort of wanting sort of reality um, all the time that there has been a shift uh, in focus and so they're uh, of sort of personal foibles, mistakes, sort of slips of the tongue, very sort of easy things that you can immediately latch onto and tear um, down. What, uh, let, me, I, let me speak to it from, from the campaign we worked on. Uh, oddly enough, and call this a mistake I, I, if you want, but oddly enough, we did not spend a whole lot of time internally trying to change who this, this woman was. Um, um, we didn't spend a, a whole host of time worrying about um, do we need to, you know, there was a big debate, she wore pink to a debate, and so there was some question of like, was that a calculated decision that she would wear pink to soften herself against her opponents? I didn't think twice about what she wore. Um, I mean, maybe that was a mistake, but it wasn't something that we sort of focused on uh, as much as I think a lot of folks think we do. Um, but I do think to some degree there has been, um, because of the desire to sort of, of scandal, the desire of celebrity, the desire of sort of reality, that there is a focus now in campaigns and politics, just like there is in sort of the regular celebrity culture, to pull out these sort of moments that are not indicative of anything other than a slip of the tongue or some silly little thing you did in college or some argument you might have had that you and I would have had anyway with anybody else. But since we're running for office, it gets heightened and people latch on to it. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, I, I want to add one other thing. I'm not sure this is an answer to your question exactly, but there was some debate, and this kind of goes back to the, uh, some of the earlier questions about um, softening her, like were we trying to soften her image? And again, I don't know if that goes to your uh, question exactly, but um, there was an article in the uh, New York Times actually 
uh, in March of last of this year, which talked about her temper. Uh, we, we kind of talked about her temperament um, and the fact that she would yell, had a tendency to yell sometimes, which she did, she does, um, uh, and kind of what the impact on the campaign was of that story, which was quite dramatic, actually. Um, and it goes to the story, it kind of goes to the issue of how are women interpreted, how are women seen um, differently than men. A man who has a temper is seen sometimes as a leader, or a woman who has a temper can be seen as a, uh, the B word. Um, and uh, then there was another story that came out later about her uh, having struggles with bulimia and uh, alcoholism. Uh, and we came out with that story, and we led that, put that story out in part because for the, you know, the year before she ran, she was panicked that someone would have seen her in a meeting, an AA meeting in the village, someone who didn't like her, and anybody but Quinn person would come out and say, which I guarantee you would have happened in August, two weeks before the election. So we said, well, we're gonna get that, we're gonna, we're gonna get that story out, and nothing to be ashamed of, and uh, she was in, uh, uh, you know, getting, you know, had help and was not, enough, you know, was not drinking, et cetera. And when we put that story out, the reporting was we were softening her, her image. image because of a story that the New York Times had written th three months before that said she had a temper. And so um, I don't know if that answers your question, but it shows the complexity of running for office, shows the complexity of running for office as a, especially as a woman, uh, and shows the complexity of running for office as a woman in New York City. And, and I would just add, you know, the last, <laughs> <laughs> a strategy of um, talking about the fact that you're a bulimic and an alcoholic as a way of softening your image is a bit silly, but nonetheless, that's how it, how it got interpreted. Two more questions. Yep. Um, hi, thank you all for being here. Um, my name is Lizzie, and I'm a Master of Public Policy student at the Kennedy School. Um, up until recently, um, and for most of the campaign, I think I was living in New York City, and many of the events that I attended um, particularly events uh, for the LGBT community, people would introduce Christine Quinn as our next mayor, Christine Quinn, and I think there was a lot of confidence, especially in the LGBT community, um, that was outwardly portrayed, and I'm wondering how you feel about whether that might have helped or hurt the campaign. The I mean, we didn't show this clip, but look, there are certainly segments of uh, any voting populace um, that um, there are religious sects, there are sort of oftentimes seniors um, who um, that's a, a disqualifying factor for them. Um, do I think it was um, a, a, do I think it overwhelmed in this race, if, if identity politics were pervasive, I think oftentimes her gender in this race became more of a factor than her sexuality. That being said, there are certainly populations that um, it just is a non-starter for. Um, and I, I think dramatically in the documentary, you see um, at a, a, a gay rights rally, people sit, allotting her saying she's our big dyke the next mayor and then the next scene you see these you know orthodox rabbis saying she's evil and she should never be elected so i think that captured the dramatic differences yeah. um why don't we go to the last question hi thank you for being here uh, my name is valentina perez and i'm a junior at the college going back to some of the things that you were commenting on about the way that women candidates are covered um to the uh, journalists and reporters on the panel. Why do you think that um, we still, what, uh, women candidates are still talked about, um, uh, still talked about a lot more in the ways that they dress, in the ways that um, their, in their physical, in terms of their physical appearance, in terms of things like their laugh and their temper. Why do you think that uh, this type of coverage, which, like you said, isn't often uh, talked about in reference to male candidates, persists? Nancy, what do you think? That's a tough question. I mean, I think part of what they were saying is sometimes it's the coverage and sometimes it's the way that reporting is received by the public. Um, so that's a, that's a hard question to answer. Do you guys have thoughts? Zena? I mean, I think it's something that everyone can do a better job in sort of being conscious of their biases. But I, 
um, I do think that you know we can ask ourselves all the time, like why are we making this editorial decision? But I think in terms of um, you know how she was portrayed or or how she's reported on, you know, I I think she she is a woman. She's a gay woman. She also was a speaker, and I heard a lot of people talking about issues and being very educated about the issues and voting for her or against her or for another candidate based on the issues. So I think it was part of a mix, but I don't think it was so, um, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong about this, but I don't think it was like one of the top reasons people voted for or against her or, or she was portrayed one reason or another based on that. I don't know, I think it was just more subtle. Um, it's a good question. I don't think anyone knows the answer, but. I think it goes, because we've obviously thought a lot about this. It goes to the qualities. It's not so much the stories themselves, although there's some of that. It goes to the qualities that people look to in leaders as a male leader and as a female leader. And what happens is when you have a temper, when you are the tough speaker of the city council, and she was the tough speaker of the city council, and if you, let's be, if you, you know, crossed her, she was not going to look too kindly on it. The same way that Tip O'Neill wouldn't, that other strong leaders would not in a legislative body, because that's how you have to run a legislative body. But the qualities that people want in a woman leader are nurturing, diff slightly diff are different words and different qualities. And so it becomes much harder to run as a woman leader unless you can lead with nurturing. As I said in the, that clip, like leading with tough is very hard. Um, and I think you saw it with, uh, you know, I think you saw that with Hillary to some degree, that there was some, some of that. And, and let me just say, let you in on some inside detail of something that, that is on the cutting room floor that shows how we dealt with the gender issue in a complicated way. Um, Brent put together a one minute trailer for people to see, uh, to get them interested in seeing this documentary. It op he opened it with um, Christine Quinn being made up. And we all thought this was a great intimate moment that showed you right away her, that we got access. We're seeing behind the scenes. One of our bosses said, wait a minute, we are not going to put out as the first scene in our trailer to this documentary, we are not going to put out a woman candidate being made up. But then we said, and there were women who made that, helped make that decision. Like, I didn't think twice about it. Zaina didn't think, you didn't think twice when we first saw it, I don't think. But then you think of, then we, when we said, well, if it was a guy, if it was de Blasio being made up, we might have opened with that. But then we realized, well, maybe so. Maybe it takes on a different meaning if it's us and a woman candidate. I mean, I don't know the answer, but, you're, but all these things are much more complicated than, than you think for us, for them, for everyone, and how people interpret what she says or how we report it or when we comment on what she's wearing. Do we do that with the male candidates? It, these are very interesting, complicated questions. Can I yes. Just, can I, just, I, I don't want to leave the because I feel like we've been talking a lot about this and it's an important topic. I don't want to leave folks with the impression that we believe that she lost because she was a woman or because she was gay. Because I do not believe that's why she lost the race. It is a complex issue to deal with. It is a complicating factor, but that's not why the election turned out, in my opinion, the way it turned out, the way it, the way it did. Thirty-second question for Brent. Um, what scene was left out that you wish hadn't been cut out? There was a, one of the strategy sessions before the third debate, probably. Um, and it was uh, Josh, I say, was in the room. She was in the room, a few of her, of her um, strategists and advisors. And this was when de Blasio was the clear front runner. Um, and so it was more sort of a change of strategy of how do we attack? Um, and how do we use the, the Times and other newspaper endorsements to our advantage? And uh, there was a moment where you were sort of looking, or she was looking to the endorsement for talking points about wh what she should say in, in an instance if she's challenged about her, her vision for the city. And I thought that that was um, an interesting moment 
you had to be in the room for a while to really make it pay off, and so for certain reasons it didn't work in the, in the piece, but I felt like um, it, was, it was a very interesting scene. And Mike or Josh, 30 seconds or less, is there a scene you wish had been cut out of the documentary? <laughs> um, the last, the very, very last scene when you go to the final shot of her sitting there. Um, uh, she's on the stage, uh, you sort of pan out, and I look like I'm about to jump off a cliff. Um, that that would have that been fine to take out. <laughs> and, and finally, um, guys, has Christine Quinn seen this documentary? Not as of Thursday. She has not. Yeah. Will she ever? I'm sure she will. I'm sure she will. Did um, you tell her she should see it? No. <laughs> 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 if you were her, would you have seen it by now? No. I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah. I wouldn't be weird. No. But don't you kind of want to know what everyone else is seeing? She knows the last scene. She knows how it turned out. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. not, yeah. Yeah, you know, it's not the mystery. She, I mean, you know, not, not for nothing, but you don't need the New York Times to tell you what took place over the course of the last year. She lived it. Okay. Um, so. On that note, thank you all of you for being here. Thank, thank you. you.